So the Philippines is like the largest um, cultural collections in terms of art in the world. We have about 263 attractions, uh, a number of which are tall varieties and some are dwarf varieties, and of course uh, hybrid varieties. So when we were starting with the Philippine Genome Center several years ago, and we were not really very experienced with next generation sequencing and so on and so forth. So of course, our effort um, was started with microbial whole genome sequencing. And the next question we asked was, what would be a project that would have more meaning and that would come to affect um, our Filipinos? So of course, rice would be there, but rice is under a different um, mechanism. You know, the International RS Research Institute in the field rice, and that is funded by the Department of Agriculture. So the next mechanism would be, um, would be mango and so on. So of course, we want to enter into coconut. Coconut under the fact that we have a very rich uh, collection of um, the world's resources in coconut. So uh, we visited this very large plantation in Nambuanga, in the southern part of the Philippines. And um, or the, you can see as far as the ice could reach, rows upon rows of coconut. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the coconut, everything is useful from the fruit, the husk, the water, the meat, the sand, the leaf, and everything that would be very, very useful. Next slide, please. Um, so if you look at the um, production in terms of land area uh, around the world, the, the Philippines runs second, the first one is Indonesia, because obviously in terms of land area in Indonesia it's about twice the land area of the Philippines is about 15,000 islands where the Philippines is about 10,600. So the, Indonesia has the largest production in terms of um, coconut, followed with the Philippines and then India, Brazil, and of course Sri Lanka next slide please. But in terms of um, coconut oil export, the Philippines runs the first followed by Indonesia and of course Malaysia. So the, um, the Philippines is the top exporter of uh, coconut oil in the world. Of course, Malaysia and other countries are a lot up higher in terms of oil pan. The production is about 15 metric, million metric tons of nuts produced per year. Uh, this is the average in the last 10 years in the Philippines. And this accounts for about 30% of the total agricultural earnings in the country and 18% of our exports, particularly on coconut oil. And our top market is the U.S. and the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So if you look at the distribution of coconut in the Philippines, of the planting in the Philippines, there are about 68 of 81 provinces in the country are in the coconut production. And an average of 14.9 million knots are produced per year. And this is the average in the last few years. And to provide employment to about 3 million Filipino farmers. So you will see that a lot of the areas, for example, in Mindanao and in Luzon are planted with coconut. But amazingly, also the poorest of the poor, the poorest farmers in the Philippines are actually those who are engaged in coconut farming. So um, if you look very, very closely um, in the Philippines, comments on the fact of the importance of coconut in the industry and in the agricultural production in the Philippines, the Philippines is this Philippine Coconut Authority that is engaged with production, breeding, as well as distribution of coconut. Um, it has a very, very colored history for a long, for some, sometimes it, reach, it reaches a peak, sometimes um, it doesn't know whether it is a quasi-government sector or a private sector, etc. So for example, the Philippine Coconut Authority is in, under the Department of Agriculture. So, um, as I mentioned previously, the poorest farmers are actually those engaged in production or uh, in coconut planting, and the productivity is really, really high. So when we approach the Department of Science and Technology at Oshikana, the challenge is really to increase production in coconut. And in fact, we see as already telling that for as long as uh, they're using hybrids, that would be okay. So these are some of the common varieties in the Philippines. And I mentioned about 250 accessions. And these are collections from different parts of the world, all of which, of course, from different areas around the Philippines. So we have white pea, white pine, white tall, tutupine tall, vanuati uh, tall, and of course, uh, lots of dwarfs of these Philippine Indian species. And then, of course, we have the Malayan red dwarf and the Nantal. So 
broad practices, and we know that there is, when we want, wanted to sequence the genome of the corona, it was a rather challenging time five years ago, primarily because it's a very large, it's a very large genome, and it is highly repetitive. How repetitive is not really know, but it's very early on, about 70 percent. And when we were doing this project, we realized that we had as far as 80 percent repetitive sequence. So for our purposes, we wanted to have a reference sequence for the coconut, and we decided to do it with both uh, and we rejected a lot. Do you want to call it? Can you return to the previous slide? Yes, we're going to call it under the main dwarf. If you see a dwarf coconut full of fruits, it's really, really impressive. And I was wondering, why is it that we are not producing a lot of dwarf varieties? Do you know the answer? Because they can easily be stolen. <laughs> <laughs> so when you go to the plantation of the Philippine Coconut Authority, they do not give you a cola, they do not give you a pineapple, your staff would essentially be who could choose a coconut tree. It's, it's impressive, it's delicious. And also, really, you know, so a lot of our farmers, even if, of course, it's easier to harvest to do our coconuts, we would prefer the tall varieties for security reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we decided to do a lot of tea, and a primarily because they are the heirloom varieties in the Philippine community, used in a lot of uh, breeding and hybrid studies. So, next slide. So, okay. So uh, essentially, we wanted to have a reference genome, so a transcript node. And of course, it is also part of the evolution of the Philippine Genome Center because we are really, really a new facility and we were very um, thankful that we were able to next generation sequencers along the way. During that time, of course, we did not have a pop viral uh, sequencer yet. So some of the sequencing that we did in the beginning were essentially of, um, of, um, of source. And we all noticed in the many of the power um, and posters at the Philippine Coconut Authority in Tamwata, many of them were using as a that are generated by others and probably 30 years of the resolution of the building in the One of our main strategies is to come up with better as a transactor. So this is our project workflow. We did both um, pollen and then uh, leaf. And of course, we know, so we were challenged with looking for markers involved in high light field, um, what else? Uh, shell thickness, study field, study field, and this is like the juice of the coconut that is used to make coconut wine or tuba, and of course, water quality. Um, so we did multiple sequence platforms for bio. In the beginning, there was molecular technology, and of course, Illumina, the genome assembly, the analysis, and change from support. The whole genome sequencing uh, and assembly, for the whole for the assembly, we received um, help and guidance from our friends and collaborators from the National Institute of Genetics in Michigan, Japan. For the rest, um, essentially differential transcriptomics. So this was a journey of, uh, we did not have highly paid bioinformaticians, so we had to develop the bioinformaticians ourselves, and many of these are really, really young students. So um, essentially, it's about the first challenge. How, how large is the coconut genome? There have been several estimates of Q in three gardens in Los Angeles, it's at 3.6 GB. So finally, we were able to resolve it both uh, using PMR statistics and flow uh, cytometry. The cat D genome, the one that is just about 2.9 GB, whereas the um, lab D genome is about 2.6 GB. And I think the main difference is really on the number of repetitive sequences. So the levels of the fact that the dwarf genome is self-pollinated, so it's in, you know, in red, whereas your um, open pollination happens in the tall varieties. Okay, next slide, please. So when we look at the repeat content, this version 3 of assembly, the repeat content for the tall variety is about 70%, and the dwarf variety, which is a larger uh, genome size, which is 2.5 to 2.9 GB, is about 80%. However, the number of the projections for the coating of the sleep and magic is a dwarf variety with a larger genome size, so and at least in our estimates, the projected code, gene coding squares is much smaller than the lab. So essentially what happened was, as if you look at the analysis data, on, the, um, the large genome size is mostly because of the repetitive squares, particularly uh, code and So when we did annotation, a lot of the genome Involved, the genes involved are involved in biological processes and lots of function and Next slide, please. 
studies. So when we did the genome repeat analysis for the genome, we noticed that um, in comparison, for example, to the oil palm, the sequence of which has been published, and the big palm genome, so the big palm is small, 605 MB. The oil palm genome is about 1.8 GB, and, but the uh, dwarf coconut is really, really large, it's about 2.9 GB. And uh, if you look very, very closely, this is essentially because of the expansion in genome size as a consequence of the retrotransposons, um, particularly several weeks of um, insertion events and the repeats. Look at the next slide. If you look at this one, so there are, we found that um, there have been massive insertion events of the cochlear retrotransposon in both the coconut on the left and, of course, in the oil palm genome. Uh, and these are represented by the peaks in blue. Essentially, there are a lot of gypsy and cochlear reproductive sequences in the uh, genome. So, what makes the cochlear genome larger, for example, than the palm genome as the, as the other genomes? Essentially, we have to the some part of because of the large, uh, the later, later um, round of um, insertions or repeats. Um, and we believe that this suggests that the coconut genome is transpositionally active. Next slide. So, um, this is not a platinum level sequencing. We have not sequenced the coconut genome to the level of the coconut, so this is short term sequencing. Hopefully, if we get more money, we will do it um, using a final. So, we, um, we aligned it with the scaffolds of the oil palm genome, and of course, um, these types, which is our, uh, there are a lot of very limited sequences and um, Next. So, the coconut is a highly repetitive genome compared to its closest relative in the Arasi family, um, such as Phoenix, the Bifera, as and the Larsen, and so the big time the oil palm. The rapid transposons are the most abundant of these types with Kopi and Gypsy, the most numerous families, just like in the big time and the oil palm. Next slide. So, we estimated also probably the divergence of coconut compared to the, the closely related. Uh, families and the uh, estimate is about uh, 46 uh, million years ago. There is a divergence between the coconut as well as the oil palm genome. Next slide. So we also sequenced the uh, transcriptome of both the Gunatol and the Pitan Beans world and we aligned them to the genome genome from the um, next slide. And we look for the SSRs using our, our draft. Uh, whole genome sequences and came up with several. Next slide. So we have found about 2,320 local SSR markers for the partial genome assembly, and we have um, generated markers that could identify these 12 varieties of coconut using these markers. And we also are, um, um, as we speak, a continuing um, um, monitoring and studying the S2 mapping population, which is in Zamboanga. So the, this challenge in the coconut is compared to our adoptive varieties, you know, the generation time is very long. So normally for the tall varieties, the first flowering time is seven years. And for the dwarf variety, it's about three, five years. So if you were going to look for the characteristics of each individual um, organism, it takes a lot of time. So um, so from the novel as the markers, you can use this for identification of different uh, cultivars within the culture collection of the coconut. And at the same time, we are using, um, using our F2 mapping population, looking for certain characteristics like first root emergence, flowering time, and so on and so forth. So these are all contained in the presentation in the Zamboanga city. Next slide. So um, we were also tasked with looking for potential markers for some of the desirable traits, such as nut yield, thickness, sub yield, and high water quality. So now we report that next slide. Um, next slide. So we report that, uh, yeah, this, uh, prior to that, let me just go to some of the anatomy of the coconut. So this is the anatomy of the coconut. If you look at the, the just does begin from the outermost region, so it's called the ankle carp, this is the outer layer. The coconut, the young coconut could be green or sometimes reddish, but the old coconut, the one where we get our coconut milk, will be brown in color. And then you have the mesocarp, which is the coconut husk. 
and then followed by the shell, which we call the endocarp, is the surrounding seed. And inside is called the coconut apple. Okay, the coconut apple is prior to it becoming a seed, but normally we don't eat the coconut apple. We eat the coconut meat. The coconut apple only occurs in the old coconut valley for planting. So the coconut meat is called endosperm. So when we eat the we drink the who coated the young coconut. But for the extraction of the coconut milk or oil, it has to be the old coconut where the color of the exocarp is brown. Next. So we use several of the markers that we, we got for not um, yield and for drug thickness. Next slide. So in the next phase, we have now come up, this is through uh, RTCR, several genes that we can use for, um, uh, as markers for uh, drug thickness. Next slide. And we also have several markers now uh, for high quality of um, we have that with the, 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 the nature of but these are gene markers. Next slide. So these are a lot of ongoing validation studies using a uh, population there in Zamboanga. Uh, hopefully, uh, so as far as the varietal uh, um, identification is concerned, there are some the SFR markers. But for the desirable quality of meal, uh, water quality, shelf thickness, uh, we are doing a lot of validation studies. So um, there are a lot of validation studies going on. Of course, there are no kinds of hybrids. And we have several teams from the University of the Princess Bias continuing with our studies in the breeding, uh, predatory productivity and industrial trees. The detail mapping is being done by Dr. Rianio. And of course, Dr. Galvez, who is the program leader of the Coconut Genomics Project, is developing web-based tools for breeders. Next slide. So we have these are our latest publications for the whole genome sequencing. Uh, next slide. And of course, uh, there is a special issue for the Philippine Journal of Science where we have three uh, publications um, on the coconut transcriptome and of course all the synthesis genes. Next slide. So these are just to tell several of these um, study is also a, a beneficiary of the Year, many years, more than 25 years of breeding studies that are being done at the Philippine government Authority. We would like to add to that by developing markers and molecular markers to identify traits and to help, for example, in um, hybrids and essentially to measure heterosis prior to distribution to the farmers. Next slide. So I would like to introduce the members of our project team along with all of my students graduate students, um, some of whom have already left, and our um, collaborators on the Philippine Government Authority, the, Mr. Rivera, Dr. Susan Rivera, and of course, um, in, Ernesto Emanuel, from the National Institute of Genetics in Japan, Dr. Fujiyama, and Dr. Noguchi. For the transfer points team, this is headed by Dr. Bautista, Dr. Susan Rivera, and a lot of our graduate students. For the SSO marker development, this is done by Dr. Badahan and Dr. Zedanilia with the research assistant of Mr. Rodizzo. So our Amanat Genomics program is originally was headed by Dr. Rita Laude, who has a retired, and Dr. Heidi Laude, who has a shrimp this time. So that's all. Thank you very much.